Meet Zippy, the flying little brother of the Vegas Sphere. A project that started as a fun and seemingly simple idea. But little did I know, it would end up taking me well over a year of designing, building and testing to finally get to this point. But why did I even build it? What was that one missing thing that eventually made it work? And perhaps the most burning question, how much did it cost to build what probably is the world's first flying LED display? To answer those questions, we'll first need to go back in time a bit. Back to 2017 to be exact. When I still worked full time as an engineer and was asked if I wanted to join a team to build one of the biggest LED displays out there at that time. Yep, that's me. The display had a surface area of almost 1300 square feet. It was mounted 118 feet above the ground and it had more than 1.1 million individual LEDs. But total price tag of the project $460,000. And when I heard that, I just couldn't help but wonder if it would be possible somehow to do the same, so show images high up in the sky, but cheaper. So back then, I started building what basically was the very first version of Zippy. But it was a total disaster. Crash after crash. Basically, every flight ended in destruction. So eventually, I just gave up. But it stung, even in the years after. Because come on, if they can catch rockets falling from space, then surely it should be possible to make a display fly, right? So when I stumbled upon the project again a few months ago, all I could think was, maybe it's time to give this project another shot. But this time though, we're not going to guess and hope it'll work, like I did the first time. Instead, we're going to do it the scientific way. Starting with the display. Because to make a display fly, we'll need something that's lightweight and use as little power as possible. Which means our best bet would be to make something called a persistence of vision, or POV display for short. It uses just a few rows of LEDs and spins these around really fast to create a full 360 degree image. And the way that works is actually kind of crazy, because it's constantly tricking our brains into seeing parts of an image that aren't even really there. Here, let me show you what I mean. Right now, the LED is blinking 6 times per second. As you can clearly see, right? But now, watch what happens when I increase the blinking speed to, let's say... 60 times per second, it suddenly appears to be continuously on. Even though it's still blinking as we can see when we look at it in slow motion. That's because there is a slight delay between our eyes and our brain. And because the blinking is happening so fast, our brain stitches everything together into one continuous image. However, this is just one single and stationary LED. But the display will have 144 of them that will be spinning insanely fast. So if we want to trick our brains into seeing a continuous image, we're going to need to spin our LED strips exactly fast enough. And display every row of pixels at exactly the right time. So everything has to work perfect in sync, which means we first got a little problem to solve. You see, for version 1, I thought I was being smart and designed and printed these segments as support for the LED strips that could be glued together to form the round shape of the display. With the idea that they would slice through the air like a knife. But that wasn't exactly what happened. Just listen to the sound it made when it started spinning faster and faster. Does this sound like a knife slicing through the air to you? Not exactly, right? I think we can agree that the 3D printed segments have got to go. Now, I have no idea if this will work or not, but as replacement for those 3D printed segments, I've ordered some of that fiber rod which is normally used in wind kites and stuff. The only question is, how do we attach the LED strips to it? Because I'm pretty sure the double sided tape on the back won't stick enough to keep them in place when spinning over 1000 RPM. Now we can of course always tape the two together, but I think I've got something better. What about some transparent heat shrinking tube? Will that do the trick? I guess I grabbed the right one this morning. 
because so far this is turning out even better than I was expecting. But then of course, this was the first and easiest part. The hardest part is yet to come. But we'll get to that in a minute. Because the next step will be figuring out how we are going to spin around the LED strips. And for that we're obviously going to need a motor. But that's where we run into a problem. And it's a serious one. You see, no matter what motor we use, it will always be mounted to the same center shaft our drone will be mounted to. But as soon as we'll spin it up, Newton's third law of motion comes into play, which states, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Which in our case means, when the smaller gear on the motor starts to push away the larger gear to try to spin up the display, it also pushes itself away in the opposite direction. And because of that, the center column, and thus the drone, will start to spin uncontrollably. Simply because in mid-air there's nothing to hold on to or push against to stop that from happening. And that's a problem. Here, let me show you what I mean. I put together this bearing block with an adapter on a steel axle on top of which the display can be mounted. This way the LED strips as well as the drone can move freely from each other without any resistance. Just like when it would be flying in mid-air. We're basically simulating a real mid-air flight, but right here on my workbench. And for the sake of visualization, because we haven't got our drone frame yet, I've laser cut a cardboard dummy drone on my X2P2 to serve as its stand-in. Okay, so now watch what happens when we spin up the motor. The display starts to spin, just like you'd expect. But as soon as I stop holding the center column, the drone starts to spin just as fast in the opposite direction. You can imagine this makes the drone completely uncontrollable. So we need to find a way to push back to stop the drone from spinning when the display spins. To do that on the first version of Zippy, I added some servo driven flaps below each propeller to redirect the air and create a pushing force in the opposite direction. But there's one tiny little problem. because. I can't remember anymore if it actually worked good enough to completely stop the drone from spinning. So just to be sure, we're going to try something a little more powerful today. Instead of the flaps, we'll mount a couple of arms with motors and propellers to the center shaft. But the question still is, will it be powerful enough or not? But before we can answer that question, we'll first need to know with how much force the drone is actually being spun around. And to measure that, we'll use this. This is a sensor that can measure weight, also known as a load cell. By attaching one side of the load cell to the bracket and sliding the other side into the slot of the spinning frame, we can measure exactly how much force these motors will need to deliver to stop the drone from spinning. I think it will be somewhere between 500 and 700 grams. 200, 400, 600. Eight. Okay, forget my prediction. Thousand. Sixteen. Eighteen. Two thousand. Two thousand two hundred. Holy smokes. That's two thousand three hundred grams. Or two point three kilograms. Three times more than what I was expecting. Look, it even completely twisted the center column. But the question now is, can this motor-propeller combo deliver enough thrust to be able to counteract the force of our spinning display. To find out, I slightly modified the base so we can use the same load cell setup from earlier to measure the maximum amount of thrust they can deliver. So let's see what we've got. What we want to see is at least the same 2300 grams from earlier. Nowhere near close enough to what we need to stop the drone from spinning. So, what now? Adding an extra propeller to each motor isn't an option. We could replace the arms with longer ones to increase their leverage effect, but I don't think we'll gain that much from that. Maybe, just maybe, if we're lucky, 
I can find some slightly larger propellers that will still fit within the frame. Bingo! It's tight, but they fit. But how much difference will they make? That's more like it. That's more than enough to stop the drone from spinning. Theoretically at least. Because we won't know for sure until we've actually tested it of course. So, moment of truth. That's definitely good enough for a first test flight, if you ask me. Oh, and by the way, did I tell you this project is brought to you by... Find out how to drive innovation worldwide with affordable, high-quality manufacturing solutions for projects like these and many others, including yours. I personally love to use their services. Whether I need 3D printed parts, PCB design and fabrication or CNC machine parts for my projects, Time and time again, they keep surprising me with the speed at which they deliver, the quality they deliver, but perhaps most importantly, their prices. Here, they CNC machined all these complex parts for the most powerful water gun I built a little while ago for only $241 for example. And that included taxes and express shipping. On top of that, the parts were delivered in just 6 days after ordering. So, what are you waiting for? Find out what they can do for you at PCBWay.com Okay, with our display up and running, it is time to make it fly. After calculating the total takeoff weight and measuring how much weight one motor is able to lift, it turns out we'll need at least 8 motors to get the display airborne. It's two more than what I was expecting, but this should do the trick. But there's only one way to know for sure. The moment we've all been waiting for. Will it fly? Okay, we're airborne. But what will happen when we spin up that display? So far so good. But can we display images? Well, it's not 1080p, but I can clearly see what it is displaying, so check. Without a steel structure and tons of concrete? Check. Can it be deployed anytime, anywhere? As long as it's not storming? Check. Is the idea scalable? Well, yeah, to a certain extent. So, yeah, check. But what could it actually be used for? And how much did it cost to build Zippy? Well, honestly, I haven't thought about practical use cases for a second yet. I just really wanted to make it work first. But now it does work. Correction, did work. What I wanted to suggest was to make a compilation video with all the ideas you guys were going to come up with of how you would like to see Zippy be used in real life or what image or video do you really want to see flying through the air. But now, what do you think? Should I rebuild Zippy for that compilation video? Or do you think it's worth rebuilding it anyway for other reasons? I'd love to hear what you've got in mind in the comments below and who knows Maybe your ID is the one that will convince me to rebuild it again afterwards.